your organization runs training courses for your staff and customers. Only problem is, it's time-consuming, inconvenient, and costly. Take a leaf out of our book. The School of Hard Knock Knocks uses the online training platform by YZ, and our team and customers love it. It's simple to use, supports every media format, audio, video, text, and looks great on desktops, tablets, and mobiles. And for a limited time, quote SHKK when you arrange a demo and get 10% off your first year's plan. YZ helps us deliver comedy courses around the world. Imagine what it could do for your organization. YZ, that's WYZED.com. YZ, online learning made simple. You're listening to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast with me, Steve Davis. Ladies and gentlemen, your next comedian. <laughs> Shouldn't drink on an empty head, you know that, don't you? That is the shittiest heckle I've ever heard in my life. Everyone in this room is now dumb for having no. listened to it. That's a bucket list. <laughs> You have dangerously underprepared yourself for the shit that is about to get real. What does it take to create a one-man comedy show? In this podcast episode, graduate of the School of Hard Knock Knocks, Lee Ton, shares how he harnessed peer group pressure and advice from successful comedians to take the plunge with his up-and-coming Melbourne Fringe show, Where Are You From From? Host Steve Davis also peppers Lee with questions about his acting career and asks, does stand-up help with his TV roles? Plus, find out what it takes to play an Irish police officer on one of Australia's biggest soaps, Neighbours. And now, here's Lee Ton. Hey, what are you using my good material for? <laughs> <laughs> I don't always talk like that. I don't think this audience can handle two, three thick accent acts in a row. So I'll talk more for a minute. So hi, my name is Lee Ton, and yes, I'm an Asian. Yes, I know it's hard to tell. The only way I know is because the looks of both my parents, as they were constantly telling me how disappointed they were in me. It was always like, why are you so stupid? Or why are you not cured of cancer? Uh, maybe because I'm 12 years old, Mom. I just got pubic hairs last week. I'm just discovering my body right now. I don't have time to be discovering cures for terminal illnesses. I can't handle this pressure. And Asian parents, they're always comparing you to like your cousin or their friend's kids. And like, my mom was like, oh, your cousin Kevin already do the math at the year 12 level. Why are you gonna be such an asshole, Kevin? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, it's Dr. Kevin now. <laughs> so yeah, primary school wasn't that great for me. Um, and then there was high school. Oh, uh, you look like you went to high school. Uh, what, what electives did you do in high school? Woodwork. I don't even know what woodwork was. Do you know what electives my parents allowed me to do in high school? Chemistry, physics, IT, and motherfucking textiles. <laughs> Why textiles? So, as I'm studying to get into medicine at Monash, I can make an LV wallet on the side. So yeah, high school wasn't that great for me either. Another reason why high school wasn't that great was um, high school was pretty clicky. You know, there was the, the cool kids, then there was the nerds, and then there was the bullies. Oh, and the bullies were the worst. You know, all I wanted in high school was for one day just to fit in. But I was just so tall and my English was perfect that all the cool bullies, they didn't even know I was alive. <laughs> And I've got nothing against white people, I don't. You know, my mom, she raised me with good values. You know, she taught me never to judge someone by the lack of color of their skin. <laughs> Lee Ton, welcome to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast. Thanks, Steve. Great to be here. Now, I, I must just say for context that I met you for the first time uh, midway through 2018 when I was doing the School of Hard Knock Knocks course a second time uh, in Melbourne mm -hmm. that was being filmed for the TV show, Is This Thing On? Yeah. Thought you were quite a striking character back then. I'd never met you before. But then you appeared on my television screen in a police uniform. Tell me, what was all that about? <laughs> 
Um, well, yeah. So, uh, you know, aside from doing stand-up comedy, I'm also a, uh, an actor. So I have a, a small role, a very, very small role on the television program Neighbours, where I play Constable Miles Doherty. An Irish constable? Yeah, yeah, an Irish constable. Um, yeah, and it, it may not be uh, so obvious audibly, but uh, I am an Asian person. Uh, you know, it might be obvious for the name, Lee Ton, but yes, I'm an Asian person, but my character's name is Miles Doherty, an Irish police officer. And um, and yeah, so that's that's where you saw me. I, um, I, I, I don't know which scene you had, had seen me on. Um, you know, I might have been reading someone their uh, their charges or telling a child that he shouldn't be flying a drone or something like that. Uh, which episode did you see? Uh, I think it was the drone one that I caught a bit. I must confess, <laughs> I'm not a closet neighbours. Uh, viewer, I used to watch it back in the days before you were born, uh, but I haven't watched it much of late. But I did see snippets of you with the uh, the drone lesson because I've got a drone, and I just feared Lee Ton coming to tell me to you know bring it back down to earth. I really hate drones. I hate them. Wow! So it's it's been my personal mission to to get rid of all drones. Um, it's it's a very it's a very shady path. Me and drones. Uh, it might be a little bit. Uh, I might get into tears and get into too deep, but um, drones touch me in very, very strange places. <laughs> okay, I think that's for a different podcast. That topic, uh, perhaps psychology today, uh, or, or the Aviation Weekly. But um, but right, I, I want to ask you a question though. You've you've been writing comedy for a while. While you were on the soap, uh, if we're allowed to call Neighbours a soap, did. Did your did your comedy writing ear listen to the dialogue that was written for the script and notice any differences? I can't say I really make any uh, make any comparisons. As such. Um, I think uh, if, if I'm going to make any comments about writing um, for comedy, then there's you know there's certainly beats, right? Um, so there's kind of like yeah, to in beats of three. So then you kind of want to like hit those notes. So then somehow there's more impact. Um, the thing is with um, with uh, with the scripts for neighbors and stuff. It's, uh, you know, well, it is a soap, and there is kind of like a um, kind of like a, a shock factor that needs to be involved in. It. Like, oh, I can't believe that person's done that. Like the most recent thing that I had done was um, where you know the characters they were kind of like having an argument. I kind of like knock on the door and just kind of like, you know, excuse me, I'm here to interview this person. And then it's kind of like that moment where it's kind of like. Oh my god! You know that kind of thing. So I don't know. <laughs> that's uh, that's what I notice that All right. uh, in that particular scene. But um, yeah, the comedy, yeah, it, it's more kind of like. I said, yeah. Now that I'm actually sitting here and thinking about it, the the there is kind of like that that moment when you kind of like making an impact right at the end. Where it's like, whoa, okay. There you go. Now I have. Did I answer your question? Now, at this moment. <laughs> well, no, I, I, I was having some chats to people who were thinking of doing the School of Hard Knock Knocks course this week, and they said, can you learn comedy? And I said, well, I think you can. You can learn the structure, and uh, that's what you were alluding to there with just making sure you're loading the right end of the sentence. But um, uh, let's move on yeah. to, to more of your life, though, because uh, <laughs> the Melbourne Fringe is upon us, and you've got a show called Where Are You From From? And I know I was privileged mm -hmm. to hear some of the early workings of some of that work late last year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Now, according, though, to a recent hold on advertisement, you're from the future. So what exactly do you mean by where are you from from? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so um, that that is a, a very typical question that, you know, people ask. So... You know, cause, you know, you come and meet me, and then you know, I'm just your typical, you know, um, Australian-born guy. So, but my appearance is obviously Asian. So that people will go, will ask you where I'm from, and then you know, if I respond with anything that resembles just Australia or anything like that, then they'll have to go, well, you know, where are you from? From where's your, you know, where are your parents from? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that um, is where the title comes from, obviously. And then, so the, the theme of the show itself is kind of like uh, my experiences growing up in Australia, being Australian-born, you know, just completely Australian uh, altogether, but then just having that kind of that that feeling in the background where you know I am I'm Australian but different. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and can I just ask, was the catalyst for writing this, you, you've told us what is the background, but was, is there an emotional charge of just getting tired of that follow-up question, like you, you, can, you just know it's coming. No, 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 but mate, mate, where are you from from? Does it, <laughs> is, is there an emotional charge with that and that's you're working this through your system, through your comedy? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, any art is just kind of like a, a form of, of, of expression, right? So uh, for me to be able to kind of air this frustration or, you know, just tell this story in a comedic way, so then people can understand how I feel is is a, is a, is a great thing, and um, yeah, it is kind of frustrating. Like I understand it, like I understand where it's coming from, but um, but when you kind of get asked the same thing over and over and over again, then eventually you're kind of like, oh, okay. So now whenever you know anyone asks where I'm from, then I'll just go straight into it. I don't want to bother. <laughs> You know, I'd say, mm. oh, yeah, well, you know, my parents were in Vietnam. You know, that's, that's, I know that's what you're getting at. So that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> How many iterations of the set has it taken to take it from just bitterness uh, to lifting up into a realm of comedy that people can enjoy without actually having that, that heavy weight that you've been excising from your life? You, you never want to be in, on the wrong side I guess, of the wrong side of an argument, the wrong side of a conversation. And um, if you're coming, if you're starting a conversation from like a negative place, then it's not really benefiting one, I think. Mm. And, um, you know, Australians themselves, like I, you know, I don't believe Australians are really fundamentally racist, right? Like um, culturally, we're, you know, we are very multicultural and everyone's very accepting. And also Australians like to have a laugh. So, um, that's so, that, so I'm trying to so I'll get on onto their side right and they, they don't mean any harm so then that's that's kind of like a better place to, to start off right like so then if I come from that perspective and go hey okay well let's let's tell let's tell this story from a better place from the right place so then it's easier well not easier but you know if it's a, from a nicer place to to discuss these issues, then you can kind of have a laugh at it, but also understand the message behind it too. You've just uncovered a little aha moment for me from a comedy mm. writing perspective. In the realm of argument and critical thinking, there's the principle of charity. And that's where if you are potentially in an argument with someone, um, this principle mm. says, why don't you try and put the other person's position into your own words so that you're actually trying to be charitable to understand what it's like to argue their side. This suggests to me from what you've just said that if you're trying to write comedy where, you know, there's some things that have been annoying you, actually taking the extra step to get inside that person's world and look at it from their side and try and put it into words could actually be a nice way of diffusing that and unlocking some things you wouldn't have thought of yourself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, even without... Um, talking about um, you know, uh, in being in arguments or just kind of like trying to convey a message at all, just creating an in-joke, right? So then like the, mm. uh, like if we go even further back to comedy, like if you can tell a joke where the other person who is listening feels like they're in on the joke, mm -hmm. um, then that you know, also creates huge, massive laughs. Your show, I believe, is 45 minutes. So what is the methodology of getting your life crammed into such a narrow window? And if you are telling the story of how you came to be, do you have to omit certain family members? And how do you decide who's in and who's out? <laughs> yeah, so um, 45 minutes, like, you know, why it also is a short time for where I am at the moment, it's it feels like a, a lifetime as well. But, you know, at the same time, even 20 minutes can feel like a lifetime. You know? <laughs> but then once you're up on stage and all of a sudden it just disappears in a flash. Yeah. So it would be really interesting what happens on on the nights that um, I'm performing. <laughs> because, um, cause, yeah, because there'll be I mean, obviously a lot of crowd interaction and stuff, which will also take some time uh, too. Um, 
it's interesting that you bring up the omitting family members because I mean, my act has um, you know elements about my my children. So I've got two children, and the most recent performance that I've done, I've completely dropped my daughter, oh, <laughs> and boy. I've only left my son. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, um, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not the whole family makes it in or or not. Because uh, that's the thing. So the show being you know, entitled where you're from, from you know, it is actually mostly to do with my upbringing. So like my childhood and being brought up here in Melbourne. So I talk a lot about my mum and my dad. And you, you know, you've heard my bits about my mum and my dad. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, so yeah. So you know, a lot of my comedy is drawn from that because you know, it's just it's such an interesting, um, it's such an interesting and really fortunate life that I've had to have been raised here but being brought up by my, my mom and my dad, you know, who obviously were, uh, you know, migrated here from Vietnam and had to have, you know, you know essentially sacrificed their entire life and home and family just off the back of the Vietnam War and then come to this completely new place with barely any money in their pockets, barely any clothes on their back, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, to so that, you know, me and my sister could have a fortunate life that is you know, really, really very privileged. Um, so I'm very blessed for that. But there are also crazy people who <laughs> uh, have the you know the, the strict Asian parenting that you know you, you'd come to expect. Um, they're trying to adapt that and raise us here in Australia, which is the most laid back country in the world. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, but mm. as, as far as your methodology is concerned, if you're trying to do a historical life-based uh, comedy piece, how how do you tackle it? Do you just work through chronologically or do you say, here's a theme and you just pick a few bits and pieces that pull together from that theme? Just for anyone else who's thinking this might be an approach that could be helpful for them. I, I kind of heard... I remember if I heard it from like an interview or something like that, or maybe it was conversations with like the that I've met over the years. But um, they kind of just like picked a title and then they ran with that, and then the theme kind of like takes over. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, in this instance, like yeah, so it was kind of uh, a joke that I really wanted to tell on stage, and then it kind of took over the rest of the show or the rest of my writing. So then I can kind of. You know, uh, bring where you're from from and then also bring that to the jokes that I've written about, you know, my married life and the jokes I've written about, you know, my kids. Uh, I don't know if that answers your question. It yeah. suggests to me that the question that you're answering, where are you from from, is the uh, the focus that brings certain stories to the surface and certain stories not. Yeah. Mm. Um, I, I heard a whisper too that... Uh, Joe White, who was a much-loved comedian here, was a big advocate of you doing a one-man show. So he is yep. known as a bit of a, the comedian whisperer. What advice <laughs> did he give to you? How did he get you out of your shell to take on doing this show? Yeah, so um, so I got to meet Joe White uh, and on the taping of Is This Thing On as well. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then, yeah, so then I was really, really privileged and fortunate that he, to have been asked to be uh, his MC for the shows that he's done here in Melbourne. And we did shows just in, in the most recent Melbourne Comedy Festival. Um, and he is he's, he's a really, really great supporter of other comedians, as I'm sure you would know. Mm. And um, and then, you know, after the Comedy Festival, he says, hey, you're ready, you're ready to do your own show. And, you know, obviously I'm... You know, quite uh, the the fear of God that just completely <laughs> just overtook me at that moment. And every single time up until the moment that I decided to actually do it, I was just like, oh, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. But uh, further than that, like, it's really, really amazing that I've got his support. I've got support from uh, Diana Nguyen, who is also, you know, of similar. She's been performing and she produced her own web series uh, recently called Fee and Me, which I actually got to have a small part in as well. Um, and their advice to me has just been, you know, uh, just sign up. I, actually, sorry to get on, uh, go a bit off, but because um, I actually got to meet Lawrence Mooney as well, and he had the same 
um, same advice. It's kind of like just sign up for a show and then you will find yourself just committing and just putting yourself into overdrive to get this show produced and done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you kind of need that extra motivator. But if you don't kind of take the plunge, then you all, you know, you might put it off or, you know, and then you'll just keep on uh, putting off until you, maybe you'll never do it. So with their support uh, and, you know, the, and them pushing me, I, you know, went on the website, click submit, and then uh, I've got myself a show you know, in just about a month's time, and um, I've got to make it work. That's great. I, w- I wonder if the whole reason that fringe festivals make you pay a big fee up front is to force you to actually have to follow through because that's a lot of money to go down the drain if you decide to pull out. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> but, I mean, you did a fringe show last year as well, didn't you? How did you find it? I look the same thing, and I'm I'm pla- that was the Adelaide Fringe, and I'm planning two shows for the Adelaide Fringe 2020, and uh, yeah, I'm about to put that money down, and I tell you, that will shape the brain to say time to start writing. Is it a show? Is it stand up or because um, the last show wasn't straight stand up, wasn't it? it? Was um it was a performance piece, was it? It was a little bit of everything, actually. I'm doing the set part two of that, uh, but also another one where I'm going to push the brown boundaries and do some singing um, with a talented person, Becky Blade. Uh, uh, she's mm-hmm. a, a singer, a musician, and we're going to explore the art of innuendo uh, through <laughs> through song and comedy and psychology and you name it. So, yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. So I, you're all, I, I know you'll excel at the innuendo part and, and the singing as well. I mean, like <laughs> I mentioned your, your accent as well <laughs> earlier. So your, your accent will you know, is default sexy and then uh, also, uh, I presume, a wonderful Frank Sinatra-style singing voice. Hey, Lee, nice try, but this is an interview about you, so let's go back. <laughs> Thank you very much. I, I, I want to ask on the acting front and stand-up. Has stand-up affected your acting at all? Uh, <laughs> it has, actually. Um, so, because, I, I mean, I've thought about, um, you know, the two different worlds and... Um, yeah, to me, comedy is, you know, fundamentally, fundamentally like my my heart and soul. Like, I, the, as you know, there's nothing better than standing in front of, you know, between a hundred people or two people, and then telling a joke to make them laugh. Um, and then, you know, so going back to Neighbours, I was, you know, playing um, playing Constable Miles Doherty, and then uh, I got a bit of an acting note from one of the other actors, and he said, you know, you're a police officer, and you should, um, you should you know, sound more authoritative. And then in my head, I was just thinking, like, should I do it with a deeper voice or something? <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, that was the only thing that was, you know, I, I just kind of wanted to make that a little bit more funny, like, rather than kind of like, yeah, uh, be more like serious actor. If you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, comedy is is you know, to me is much more fulfilling uh, than acting. I mean, I do love both, obviously, but um, you, you get a much better kick from making people laugh. I think, or to me, exactly. Mm. And what about the acting background? Because you, you've been doing acting for a while. Did that help you, do you think, approach stand-up? Was that, was that a good grounding? It's, it, I just think it's two, it's two completely different worlds, especially for, um, for TV because um, it's not live. Like if you if in front of a camera, if you, you know, if you mess up, then you just do it again and again and again and again until you get it right. Yeah. Whereas when you're live with like an audience and you can't really do that, you know, you're, you've got that, you know, spotlight in front of you and you've got all these eyes on you. So you want to, you know, uh, perform for these people that write, let's pay tickets to see you. Um, so you want to do it right the first time. I'd love to see you um, push that to the limits one night and actually say, look, I'm doing some stand up tonight, but I am a TV actor and uh, just deliberately stuff up your jokes and redo them. <laughs> over and over again and push everyone to the limit. I'd, would, would you mind doing that 
for me? I think that's a great idea, actually. So the next time you're here in Melbourne, then I will make it an absolute point to do that. And then if uh, you, you can give me a single with it, if people start to feel uncomfortable. But I'll just keep on redoing the same joke over and over and over and over again. Lovely. <laughs> Until you give me that signal. <laughs> now, one of the, the joys of being able to do the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast is you get to talk to these people while they're still humble before they you know, rise to meteoric, <laughs> meteorically to fame. Lots of comics go on to be actors. Uh, Eric Banner's one. Um, what's your goal? Where, where does Lee Ton see himself in five, ten years? I would love to be able to kind of um, kind of be in like the Ronnie Ching kind of um, area. So, you know, so you know, he's obviously shown uh, a astounding amount of success uh, hmm. in recent times. Like, so he's you know, one of the uh, um, one of the performers on The Daily Show. He was recently on Crazy Rich Asians, and uh, I'm pretty sure he's in another TV show that's going to be airing pretty soon as well, whilst he's also touring and doing comedy quite regularly. So, I mean, he was recently here in Australia and then going everywhere. So that is um, that is very much where I'd like to be. Um, and I'll be your parents now. What are you doing to make sure that happens? I think I'm kind of doing it. I probably should be performing comedy a lot more. Um, so, you know, that is, that's the kind of the crux of the Fringe Festival. So I started, so my idea for Fringe Festival is, you know, to, to get this show, you know, written and um, fine-tuned and then bring that to a comedy festival. And, you know, I mean, another thing about, you know, signing up for the show is um, forcing you to write new jokes as well like because I've been doing uh, you know a, a lot of my jokes uh, over the last year so you know this kind of like forced me to think you know what I, I'm you know this is going to make me write some new material for this brand new show um, so that's my first step um, and then after comedy festival uh, I kind of want to you know breach into writing sketches and doing web I think maybe doing web series of my own too uh, so fortunately, I've got a good uh, support network that have experience in that area, so I can have a bounce off them and uh, continue, you know, working on neighbours. And maybe I'll just like, you know, just make out with one of the other cast members, just have this huge scandal, and then, you know, <laughs> surely the uh, uh, the buzz from that would you know, just boost my profile to astounding heights. <laughs> well, you've got handcuffs, and they're, I believe, a, quite a romantic. Uh, mechanism, so I'll f- use that. There you go. Another another tip. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Leeton, thank you so much for spending some time with me on the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast. Thank you, Steve. I'm, I'm, I'm very privileged to have been podcasted by the Steve Davis. <laughs> <laughs> and all I want to say is if you're in and around Melbourne or you can head there during the Fringe, uh, look up where are you from from. Tell me, what are your dates? So it is from uh, the 17th of September up until the 21st at Storyville. Sounds great. All the best. Lee Ton, just remember us when you're famous. (laughs) You remember me when you're just doing uh, everything you're doing. (laughs) 